Well, good evening. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study here at uh, Calvary Chapel, Northwest San Antonio. Tonight we are going to continue our study in the book of Revelation. If I could get my computer going here. Our chapter tonight is Revelation 7, the entirety of the chapter, verses 1 through 17. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read through uh, the passage Ahead of time, we'll just look at it as we as we go through uh, what it has to say. Um, let's pray. Gracious God, we come before you, Lord. We thank you for who you are. Lord, we lift our hearts up to you, God, and we ask that you fill us. Fill us to overflowing with your Holy Spirit and speak to us tonight, God, as we open your word. I pray, Lord, that every person listening here or listening online will receive exactly what they need to hear from you, Lord, in order to draw them into a closer, more intimate relationship with you, to be in a place, Lord, where they can receive from you who you are and they can walk in the light of your glory. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We ask that you have your way with us tonight and be glorified in all things. Lord, as always, if there's anyone here tonight or listening online that does not know you as their Savior, that has never made a personal commitment to you and have evidenced a change in their life because of being born again, I pray that this would be the day that they are born again into your family and they know without a shadow of a doubt that they belong to you and are going to heaven. We ask this in your name, Lord Jesus, for your sake. Amen. Amen. Well, we continue in Revelation. We are in the midst of the tribulation. Last week, we saw the opening of the six or six of the seven seals and the resulting devastation from the opening of those seals. Just the fourth seal alone, with its pale horse and its rider being death, and the grave following accounts for one quarter of the earth's population. That's almost two billion people dead. And then the sixth seal, the last seal that we studied last week, there was a worldwide earthquake that displaced every mountain and island on earth. We can only imagine what the death toll was from that event. And that is where our text left us. John opens chapter 7 with these words, after these things. After these things, after these things that we beheld last week in those six seals, no one has ever witnessed such devastation as what we witnessed in God's word last week. And yet, this is only the beginning. I want us to pause here for a moment and gain a little bit of perspective about what we are witnessing. It's common as we read our Bibles and read through the Revelation, we imagine these extraordinary events taking place in rapid succession, one right after another. But in fact, we need to remember that the period of the revelation or the tribulation as told in the book of Revelation is a seven year period. I believe that there is devastation and then there is time. 
for people to adapt, for people to accommodate to the change, for people to forget. Although these events that have taken place are cataclysmic and one can never truly return to normalcy, people begin to adapt. They adapt to a phrase that we are all familiar with these days. They adapt to a new normal. In a new normal, people begin to pick up the shattered pieces of their lives, and, and they find a way to survive. But sadly, many do not consider the lessons of that catastrophe. They may run to God initially, as was the case shortly after September 11, 2001, when our churches were filled to overflowing with new faces. But then they adapt to their new norm, and they forget God. After these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, on the sea, or on any tree. Again, I imagine some time between the, these seals. People are still adjusting to the after effects of this great worldwide earthquake that affected everyone in the world. Possibly they are finding their new normal. Maybe children are, are out flying kites. Does anybody fly kites anymore? We, we flew kites when I was a kid. So I see them flying kites, majoring myself. Leaves are blowing in the wind. Maybe people are out sailing on sailboats. Then all of a sudden, without any warning, the wind stops. There is nothing, not even the slightest breeze. Kites fall from the sky. The leaves fall to the ground. The sails in the boats become slack and the boats cease moving. There are no waves at all. Nothing is moving. It's like someone just hit a pause button and you can just feel it. And you know that something is about to happen. You know it. You sense it. That sudden calm reminds me of Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41. So let's look at that. Another calm in our scripture. It says, that day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side, leaving the crowd behind. They took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, teacher, don't you care if we drown, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. They saw quiet at the word of Jesus, and they were afraid. Now, there are two reasons why the disciples should not have been afraid. The first reason is found in verse 35. Jesus said, let us go over to the other side. He didn't say, let us go to the middle of the sea and drown there. He said, let us go to the other side. If Jesus gives you a destination, if he tells you you are going this place, you're going to get 
to that place. That's number one. Number two, they're with Jesus. They are with Jesus. Now, granted, by this point, Jesus has impressed them with many things, but they don't know him yet. Not like we know him. They have not seen the resurrected Christ at this point. They don't have his complete word, the word of God, as we do. They do not have the Holy Spirit indwelling them in guiding them in all truth and witnessing to them that they are the sons of God. So I'm going to cut them a little bit of slack. But you, no slack. Because you have all of those things. You know him. You have witnessed him from his word. His, his very spirit has transformed your life and you have been born again. And, and he says that he will never leave you. Here's some promises. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We can rest in that. That's a destination that Jesus has promised us. The, the completion, the day of Jesus Christ, he is going to take us to that day. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I would never leave you nor forsake you. Jesus will never leave you. I like that context. It's actually talking about money. It says, don't be covered. Don't, don't, don't be grabbing and holding on to things. Be content with what you have. Because he said he'll never leave you. That speaks to us if, if God calls us sometimes to a different place where we might feel a little bit insecure in our finances. He's with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. These are some precious promises of God that he is taking us all the way to the finish line. We don't have to be afraid of the journey on the way. No matter how tumultuous the sea gets, no matter what circumstance we have to endure in our lives, we can be confident that Jesus is going to take us to the finish line. Now, speaking of seals, let's see what this pause between the sixth and the seventh seal is all about and what is going to happen. Verse 2, then I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, do not harm the earth, the sea, or the trees till we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel were sealed. Of the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Reuben, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Gad, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Asher, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Simeon, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Levi, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Issachar, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Joseph, 12,000 were sealed. Of the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000 were sealed. So the event that we have here taking place is the sealing 
of the servants of God in their forehead. 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, there has been much speculation about these 144,000. And it seems that many false religions like to claim these 144,000 for themselves. The Jehovah's Witnesses once claimed that these 144,000 was their entire group exclusively and that they were the only ones going to heaven. But something happened. They grew larger than 144,000. So they had to change things. Now the 144,000 is reserved for a select group of Jehovah's Witnesses, and the rest of them have to live on earth. They have to stay on earth. They can't go to heaven. The Seventh-day Adventists claim that the 144,000 are those 144,000 that will be found worshiping on the Sabbath when Jesus comes, and they are the ones that will be saved. Still, there are those that claim that the 144,000 are representative of all of God's people, including the church. Well, I like to look at it just plainly for what it says. The language here is pretty specific. From the tribes of Israel, 12,000 servants from 12,000 or from 12 specific tribes. Revelation 14 gets even more specific when it describes the 144,000. It says that they are male virgins. So these are male virgin Jews described as having never defiled themselves with women. It says that no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. They are obviously devout Jews. They have kept themselves pure from sexual sin, but they did not know Jesus at the time of the rapture. Although these are fine, respectable, God-fearing men, good works apart from Jesus is not good enough. You must be born again. There are people right now that live pious lives out of fear of God, but their religion cannot save them. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no salvation. There is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus. Sincere as they were, they didn't know Jesus, they missed the rapture, and they're in the tribulation. But by God's grace, the tribulation woke them up. Their eyes were opened, and they realized who Jesus is. And now, these 144,000 male virgin Jews are on fire for Christ. They have been given a special mission by Jesus, which we will see as we look at the next passage, what indicates that mission is. The sealing of this 144,000 is a special seal of God that makes them indestructible through the tribulation. They will all come through the tribulation unharmed because they have the seal of God on them. Now, I should mention that in this listing of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Dan is missing. No tribe of Dan, but yet there is still 12 tribes listed. How can that be? Funny math? Well, oftentimes, the tribe of Joseph, having had a a double portion, is listed as Manasseh and Ephraim. In this listing, Manasseh is listed, but Ephraim goes by the name of the parent. 
Joseph, the tribe of Joseph. So we still have a list of 12 absent the tribe of Dan. So the question is, why is Dan missing from this list? Well, I can't be 100% sure. No one is. But some say it's because they believe the Antichrist will come out of the tribe of Dan. And that's based on Genesis 49, 17, which says, Dan shall be a serpent by the way, a viper by the path that bites the horse's heels so that its rider shall fall backward. Some say the Antichrist may come out of the tribe of Dan. Some say it's because Dan was the tribe that introduced idolatry into Israel based on Judges chapter 18, verse 30. So I can't say for sure, but we do know that the tribe of Dan is not forsaken by God because in Ezekiel 48, where the land is apportioned to Israel in the millennial kingdom, Dan is the first tribe listed. So God has not forsaken them. He will redeem all of Israel. Now, the next section of Scripture gives us an indication of the purpose and mission of the 144,000. Verse 9 says, After these things I looked, and behold, and a great multitude which no one could number of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with, with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. We see a great multitude here. It says, which no one could number, all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb with white robes and palm branches. Now, because of the, the proximity of this group, this diverse group, and the mentioning of the 144,000, and who this multitude are as revealed in verse 14, many believe that the 144,000 are responsible for this group, meaning that they have been given in their special mission by Jesus in the tribulation is evangelism, that they are evangelizing during the tribulation and preaching Jesus Christ to those that are in the tribulation, telling them, what they need to do in order to be saved. That's a hard time to be saved during the tribulation. We're, we're, we're going to get a picture right here in verse 9. We see the totality of those who came through the tribulation. It's a, it's a macro view, even though we haven't gone through the specifics of the tribulation. We see the total of all those coming out of the tribulation. We know from further studies that in the tribulation, the Antichrist will get to the point where they require anyone to get the mark of the beast in order to buy, sell, or conduct commerce. And any who refuse to get the mark of the beast will lose their head. These 144,000 will be proclaiming Jesus Christ, telling people not to get the mark of the beast or they will lose their souls. And many, many will be saved, as we see in these verses, verses 9 and 10. Verse 11, all the angels stood around the throne and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. 
Amen. This is worship. This is a worship fest. They are bowing down at the throne of God. Why? Because all of these people from every nation, every tongue, every race of people, the, the great commission has been fulfilled. Jesus said, go into all the world, every people group, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. And here we see representation from every people group saved from eternal hell. That is a cause for praise and worship of our God. There is no greater reason to worship the Lord God than salvation. It is the greatest miracle bar none is the salvation of a soul. When, when a person turns their life over to Jesus Christ and they are born again and all of their sin debt is wiped out because of the blood of Jesus, the Bible tells us that there is joy in the presence of the angels when one sinner repents. It's a glorious time of praise and worship with this multitude which no one could number. Verse 13 says, Then one of the elders answered me, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you know, like, uh, why are you asking me, you know? You the one that live in heaven, you know. So he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the lamb. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me hold again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Hebrews 13, verse 4 says, For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sin. Hebrews 13, 11 through 12, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sin. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. Hebrews 13, 19. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Their robes were made white in the blood of the Lamb. How can blood make something white? Oh, this is special blood. This is the pure blood of Jesus that cleanses us from all sins, that cleanses our very conscience from sin. We need to understand that we are washed so thoroughly from our sin that Satan has no longer a grip on us. I know we fail. I know we mess up. First John says if we say that we are without sin, we lie and do not the truth. But if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us, from all, to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is our tool of victory in the Christian life. We don't want to sin, but when we do sin, we confess our sin. We forsake our sin. We receive forgiveness for our sin, and we move on. The blood is to cleanse our very conscience from sin. Once you have received 
Forgiveness from your sin from Christ. Two things are supposed to happen. One, you don't do guilt. Two, the enemy jumps on you to try and make you do guilt. That is the enemy's job, to keep you enslaved to sin. But the blood cleanses us and makes us white, pure, innocent. We need to walk in that innocence. That will give us the victory over sin. So we won't want to sin again. Verse 15. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger anymore, nor thirst anymore. The sun shall not strike them, nor any heat, for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of waters, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Now we're looking at the conclusion those who have came out of the tribulation, we haven't even yet seen all the things that they will go through. We've already looked at famine, the black horse. We've looked at death, the, the pale green horse. All of these things, we, we've seen a great earthquake. These tribulation saints are going to go through it. They're going to be hungry. They're going to have to endure that. They're going to be scorched by the sun. When God re 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 releases his wrath on this earth, they will be affected because they missed. During their lifetime, they, they denied who Jesus was. They refused to accept him. They refuse to surrender their lives to him, so they suffer greatly. But by God's grace, they did not succumb all the way to the Antichrist and just give themselves over to evil. At one point, they said, no, I believe. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, and I must follow him if it costs me my life, and it does cost them their life. But no more hunger, no more thirst, no more sun beating down on them. They're with the lamb. He leads them to living waters. God will wipe away every tear. They will never cry out of pain out of hunger, out of need. All needs are fulfilled in the land. We have that now. We have that now. We endure the sin of this world, and we are affected by it. Yes, we, we, we have sickness, we have disease, we have, we have discouragement, we have pain, but we already are assured of our future. We have already been sealed with a much greater seal than even the 144,000 because we have been sealed by God's Holy Spirit. And we have been promised that we have not been appointed to the day of wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord. A worship fest. Our lives should be a worship fest, just loving and praising God for all that he does. And we should hunger for the souls of other men and women, that they would know our Jesus as well. We know that, that many will refuse. It's just the nature of man. The Bible tells us that many are called, but few are chosen. It's, it's sad. 
It's sad when we stand on the other side because we know where they're coming from. We were there. We were all unsaved. But now we're on the other side. We have the glory of God living in us, and we're trying to tell them, open your eyes. This world is a lie. This world cannot fulfill you. What you are seeking, you will not find. Looking for it in this world, turn to Jesus, and the emptiness of your soul will be fulfilled. That is our mission. The 144,000 have a mission in the tribulation. Our mission is here in this day of grace. We are the ministers of reconciliation to share God's word. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you, Lord. We thank you for another look, God, into our future, the future of this world. We thank you, Lord God, that you have made us wiser than our teachers because we have your word, Lord God. We have your wisdom. Gracious God, if there is any here in our midst today that needs to receive you as Savior, if your Holy Spirit is knocking on any heart and anyone needs to surrender to you to be assured of salvation in you to be born again tonight, then, Lord, I pray in the privacy of bowed heads and closed eyes, if I'm speaking to you and you need to accept the Lord, please raise your hand so I can pray with you. I'll see your hand and pray with you to receive the Lord Jesus. Is there anyone that needs to receive the Lord? If you're listening online and you need to receive the Lord, it's as simple as acknowledging that you are a sinner. You know that you are. The Bible says there is none righteous, no, not one. Acknowledge that you are a sinner and repent. That means turn from your sin. Decide right now that you don't want to live this way any longer and surrender your life to Jesus. That is called believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord means that he is in charge. You surrender your life to his authority. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You will be born again. God will put his spirit in you and you will know you are his child because his spirit will testify to your spirit. Abba, Father. He will be your dad. Gracious God, I thank you for salvation that is full and free. I pray, Lord, that someone has received your gift of salvation tonight. Lord, I thank you for your saints that are here. I thank you, Lord, for those that are listening and are committed to take your word wherever they go and to live a life of holiness before you so others will know who you are, Lord God, and can come into salvation. Lord, we are looking for this Time when you are going to split the clouds and come for us. We know, Lord, that the time is near. As we see, God, that all the pieces are in place, Lord, and, and the, the time of the Antichrist is being made more easy to evolve into what will transpire, what we read about in Revelation. So, Lord God, help us to be ready. To be looking for you, Lord, and to redeem the time because the days are short. God bless us as we dismiss now. Take us all home safely and continue to be glorified in all that we do. In your precious name, Lord Jesus, amen. God bless you guys. Have a great night. We're going to continue Sunday in the book of Ephesians. A week from today, we will not continue in Revelation. We will have a special Christmas message a week from day on Wednesday since Christmas is Friday. So we're going to have a, a Christmas Eve Eve message. So God bless you guys and good night.